Hi there, this is Miguel Campos here from Iberia University. And you are watching Teacher Learning Cast with Pete Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. Teacher Learning Cast, episode number four. This is Benjamin Stewart from Aguascalientes. And this is Piri Herrera, also from Aguascalientes, hoping that you are all well, well and getting used to watching us every Saturday, 8.15 in the morning, this cast, which is dedicated to you all, teachers and people that is interested in learning and teaching. You know, a lot of our uh, audience, uh, Piri, are English language learners themselves. So uh, you might take advantage, those who are uh, watching and interested in participating in the conversation, even to practice your English, to practice what you know, your experiences. Uh, we really want this uh, experience to be as open and transparent and as communicative as possible. So we really want the audience to get involved. We know a lot of our listeners are both in-service and pre-service English language teachers. Right. So we really would like to uh, extend an open invitation really to anyone who wants to uh, participate and be a part of the conversation. You can be part of the conversation by participating in our Facebook page. We have a Facebook page called Teacher Learning Cast. So you can post comments, give us feedback, uh, share your ideas, your perspectives. But also if you wanna participate in the live weekly Saturday morning chats that we are conducting now, uh, we really would like to uh, incorporate more people into the conversation. Right, right. This is our fourth program, and I hope you can go through the different uh, programs we have had. We have had some talks about interesting topics. We are already uh, in plans to very, very soon have with, with us some guests uh, uh, here at, uh, at the program, and we're starting to uh, call people to join us and come with us and share here live Saturdays morning. And there are different ways to do it. Uh, so you can get in contact by all, all the means. We have uh, Benjamin Stewart has his own website, and you can have the links in there, which is Benjamin L. Stewart, Stewart right? Am I right, Ben? Yes, BenjaminLStewart.wordpress.com. You'll find uh, my website there, and you'll also find a dedicated space for uh, Teacher Learning Cast where you'll find prior episodes and also different ways that you can get involved. Yes, yeah, same here with me. My website is homers2000.weeksite.com uh, slash PDHA. And there you can also have in the, in the homepage, you can have the original transmission, which I'm, uh, I'm adding the link above so you can watch a better view, better plane for Benjamin and I, and better sound also. This is just a secondary transmission in Facebook Live. And uh, here for everybody, I'm now at the camera here at, uh, at the original transmission. And we also have the website for the Teacher Learning Cast program, which you can look at it in Facebook as Teacher Learning Cast. What's for today, Ben? Well, you know, Pity, the first topic that I, I wanted to bring about, uh, bring up, and it was really something that um, that I've been thinking about a lot uh, this week. Let me open up my browser here. And the first uh, was. You know, since we teach or we help facilitate uh, teacher uh, English teachers, you know, I think we can all can relate to moments that we're in class and students might ask us a question and we don't know the answer. I think we can all relate to that. And so I, I, I thought about, well, what do you do when you don't know what to do? Like, what do, you're, what do you do when you're in a class and you're really just not sure how to answer a particular question or a doubt a student has? Or maybe the students you detect just from their behavior that they are uh, having problems or questions about certain things. Maybe they don't come right out and ask it, but you're thinking to yourself, you may not have an answer. I came across this article uh, this week, and I wanted to share it, not because I necessarily agree with all the points or the way maybe their perspective that they're uh, sharing, but I think that the message itself, I think, is an important one, and one I think, again, we can all relate to. 
And the title of it is to uh, redesign an education system, start by saying, I don't know. And this article uh, discusses the Council of Chief State School Officers that come up with, they came up with this uh, innovative lab network. And basically they set out to focus on building a local capacity for personalized learning. So they're really arguing for uh, this notion of personalized learning, which we can probably talk about later on another show about what is personalized learning. But last week we talked about personal learning networks. And I think it relates a lot to this idea of personal learning networks, uh, which again, I'll go into a little bit more here in a second. But this article uh, was really focusing on students in this inquiry driven process. And I wrote a, a piece this week uh, called Teachers, What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. And I, I came up with a few um, topics here that I wanted to get some of your feedback, Pity, on and see what you, what you think. The first thing is when, if we're in a particular uh, context and we're in a, a classroom and we're not sure the, how to answer a particular question, the first thing we might want to do is paraphrase a student's doubt. So a lot of times when students are asking questions, um, either we may not fully understand the question, we may have to come back and paraphrase, but I, I look at the paraphrasing of a student's doubts as really a way to kind of clarify and make sure that, uh, that I, in this case, the instructor knows what the, what the doubt is. And it also gives us a little bit of time to either think of uh, possibly uh, answering the question or just if we still don't understand it, then we, we better understand what the, what, the, uh, what the doubt is. Then we look at stating what is known. So it, whatever the question is, if there is something that we know that we're honest and we come across uh, and, and really come to the students and describe what we do know about that particular issue. Uh, the next would be, of, of course, acknowledging that there might be something that we don't know. So we be honest and at that moment state, okay, well, I'm not sure what this answer is. Um, and that way that there is kind of a trust between the students and teachers, because I think students know from the very beginning when we're really not sure what we're talking about. Um, you know, I think that's obvious in a lot of cases. And, I, you know, our students are are very in tuned, I think, to, to that, that type of uh, those types of responses. And then finally, commit to a follow-up response. So I like to be very specific, say, okay, either the next class I'll have an answer, or uh, if we're online, I may post something, say, okay, I'll post something later today to get back to you to address this particular issue. Um, but for me, those are the things that came to mind when I was reading this article and thinking and working with other students, really how to prepare them and um, really look at their, uh, you know, when they're in those moments where they're not sure what to do, how they would respond. Yeah, uh, if I, I can uh, see that all of these aspects kind of relate to different things we've been talking before. But I think, yes, it's really important to uh, honesty in that sense. And, and I think that's uh, the, the core of the, of, 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 uh, the article that, uh, Teacher has to be honest, first of all, with himself, uh, to, to know, to be aware of how well you prepare the class, how much you know about the topic, and, uh, and uh, don't be overconfident about that. And then try to trick students into, into uh, a masquerade of uh, being able to do everything and answer everything about the topic. I think honesty is is the first thing and and yes uh, you mentioned very interesting points starting uh, uh, starting learning from from uh, the point of view that uh, stating what we don't know paraphrase what a student say and state what we don't know uh it it it, it reminds me I, I, and that's why i a moment i i just uh, went quickly to look for this uh, this is a copy of an article right here uh, it's in Spanish, and it's called La Aventura de Ser Maestro. We read it with the students, and I think it's a comment I made in a show before, in which uh, one of the things that the author says in this author, which is Jose M. Steve, um, 
that that he said that he says that why would you give an answer to a question that wasn't asked? And from the point of view of stating what it's not known, what 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 uh, uh, being honest about this and stating what the students are saying in paraphrasing, I think it will start to raise this question. What do you think about it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was thinking. You know, th there are many, and, and I kind of go into it a little bit in my piece, which is very brief, but, you know, there, there are many different extensions that I see when we look at a particular context where a student asks a question and the teacher doesn't know. And honesty, of course, is, is a big one, but we have a lot of options, too, to kind of turn it back to the students, too, to almost turn it into a Socratic method experience where we're asking questions back to the students Right. And depending on what it is, ask indirect questions that are related, that extend around that particular issue and until you get to kind of a some sort of agreement. But that I think that there's uh, this idea that the teacher always has to have the answer at every particular moment. I think we can uh, dispel and, and look at it a different way and, and oftentimes either turn it back to the student or even turn it into – a lesson to lesson experience where we're constantly inquiring and looking and investigating and searching and finding those answers again it, and it may not happen all in one class uh, lesson yes i was uh, kind of remembering during the week i had a student at the office telling me teacher you always ask me so many questions and she <laughs> and she was kind of uh, looking for the answer and it's a challenge it's not easy to 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 go in this back and forth and not lose the ground. And, and precisely going back to, to the starting point of this, precisely not losing the ground of what you actually don't know. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and how you both together, uh, practitioners, students, uh, teacher can grow from there, from what you don't know. You yeah. mentioned, yes, yes. Con yeah, on. I was just gonna say, yeah, I mean, turning it into a learning experience, thinking the teacher as a learn lifelong learner this relates a lot to the personal learning network thinking, okay, when I don't know something, how can my personal learning network help me and assist me? Maybe they can't help me at that particular moment in class, but outside of class, of course, you, you reach out to, through Facebook, through Twitter, you go online and in some sort of forum public group that you're part of and you search out those answers. And if ideally you have a personal learning network that is working and functioning the way you want it to work, then that personal learning network is going to be working for you and be able to help you get those answers uh, in a timely fashion. Right. And, and, and that's, uh, I mean, looking for the answers in this way, it's, it's kind of uh, what, what, I, what I like doing since I'm working with uh, reflection and feedback most of the time. And little by little, I've come to realize that that uh, my my style at the beginning, when I started in this uh, teacher formation field, was uh, more focused on what I could say. And and little by little, it's been changing towards the side of what I could ask the students and and what what I could ask and make them aware of. And uh, and if some of my students are watching uh, or are watching la uh, later in the in the on demand video. They can get really familiarized with this idea of, of stating things and and asking the questions and then getting to a point in which you can even pause things because we need to do this research that you mentioned earlier uh, outside and solve that later on and look for ways of doing things you as a as a tutor but mainly them as students to share this 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 experience and that gives you growth. I mean, that yeah. Makes yeah, I think that when we reflect on our own teaching, and I and I know we all do in, in some degree, or whether we write it out, whether we uh, you know record ourselves speaking our own reflection, or if we, if it's just a mental process, I think that um, we're all constantly reflecting on how well or maybe not so well we answered or addressed students' issues. But I came across also. I'll, I'll conclude with this last piece three central questions that I think we should all be asking ourselves and as tutors of pre-service English, English language teachers, these are also, uh, I think, very pertinent uh, questions that we need to be uh, addressing to our students is the, the three questions being the first, what should the teacher start doing? So what should I start doing that maybe I'm not doing currently? 
The second question, uh, what should I stop doing? So maybe I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. Okay. What, what should I stop doing? And the third question, uh, what should I continue doing? And, you know, maybe a variation of that would be, well, what should I continue do? Uh, what should I continue to do, but maybe slightly different uh, that seems to be working uh, with for me at this time? But I think those three questions are good reoccurring questions to be asking ourselves as educators. Uh, and especially in those cases where we have student questions that maybe we don't have the best answer for at that particular time. Right. I, I think these are important questions. I would add uh, the, the, the importance of getting uh, into detail as answering these questions and try to look. I always tell my students at least one, at least one, but something specific that indicates a very specific characteristic, a very specific action or something that specifies and gives you a lead later on on exactly these questions what you are doing what you should stop doing and what you have to um, what you could continue doing or, or would be a benefit to, to to continue doing or enforce yeah it's uh, a lot like those critical moments i think that we've talked about you you yes. speak a lot about those critical moments where uh, teachers are and, and teacher trainers are able to really uh, become aware of those those particular moments in class that really generate some sort of change or a thought process or problem or issue um you know i think it relates a lot to that yes uh i mean uh, from my end just to close up about this topic i just uh, like the, that every time we discuss this kind of things i mean every topic we we have come to discuss in these shows uh we can immediately see the link about different aspects different issues i i remind uh when you talk about paraphrasing techniques for mirroring and 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 uh, reflection we, uh, we constantly bring up here. And uh, about the follow-ups, I, I kind of remember the topic, I think it was last week about uh, keeping the suit of the teacher, and that's the suit outside the classroom. You keep the suit and you do the follow-up later on, you commit yourself to keep on the suit and, and uh, bring up learning. Exactly. And, and, you know, a lot of times, a lot of our English language teacher trainers are also English language learners themselves. So just linguistically uh, practicing how to paraphrase, right, is another kind of a skill that would be kind of part of, I think, some uh, of this this idea of trying to paraphrase with students to, to clarify ideas and, and just becoming comfortable with paraphrasing. Uh, again, so it becomes a little bit more natural as they need to draw on that skill uh, in the classroom. Right, right, right. Very so, interesting. So yeah, uh, we want to remind everyone, if you want to participate, uh, you can do so by uh, accessing our Facebook page, uh, Teacher Learning Cast. It's a public page open to anyone. Uh, we really enjoy all the likes and appreciate the likes we've received so far. Uh, but let us know how we're doing. Give us feedback. Uh, it's all good. We, uh, we really do appreciate you uh, tuning in and contributing uh, to this. And I think the idea really being trying to create an open learning uh, environment or community where we can all learn from each other. That's really the, the point of, of this effort. Right. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you want uh, us to discuss. Uh, we want to hear you discuss if you want to share comments or come to the show. You can come live or, 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 or join us through, through the network and, uh, and, and, and join our Hangout. We are doing this right now through Hangouts and participate actively. Uh, uh, in in one topic your interest, we can program it. In fact, I guess we may be ready for next week, right, to bring a guest into the show, Ben. Yes, I hope so. Um, I think we're, we're planning on bringing in uh, some guests the next next show. Uh, Ken Bauer, I think we're uh, thinking about uh, bringing him in and uh, very excited about that. This, so we'll see. Uh, um, we'll see as we get closer. But uh, yeah, we really want to bring in some some people, uh, some educators, and to hear from you and to get your experiences and your insights. Okay. Uh, finally, for the people in Facebook Live, remember this is a secondary transmission in Facebook Live. The main transmission is in the link above, and you can get there and watch Ben in a better plane, me in a direct plane also, and uh, uh, a better sound. Okay, so Facebook Live is a secondary transmission. 
but you can get to us through the Facebook page, Teacher Learning Cast. Uh, look for it like that. On Benjamin's website, which is benjaminlstuart.wordpress.com. My website, homers2000.weeksite.com uh, slash pdha. Uh, what's next, Ben? Our next segment, uh, I think, Pity, you wanted to address uh, some in-progress decisions in classroom, uh, looking at uh, the time spent, how efficient or not efficient we are in our within our classrooms. Yes, uh, this is something I, I, I it's, it's something typical with uh, fresh teachers, new teachers uh, or, or uh, practitioners that are getting into, into, for the first time into classrooms and timing and following the lesson plan and, and adapting this timing is something that they are really concerned with. Uh, but I don't know, by any reason, maybe uh, uh, own, uh, teacher's personality, I mean, th their own personality or the kind of formation they have had so far leads them to this. But yes, they're really concerned about timing and completing lesson plans. And a couple of issues always occur like that in, in that matter. Uh, sometimes uh, teachers cut activities in order to complete the lesson plan of the day. Some other times they just extend an activity and they just, uh, they're not aware that they're missing time for the further activities in the class. So things like those occur. The, the thing is that, uh, the point in here is that it's a big concern uh, for the teacher and for the learner, for the for the language learner, uh, it may be a big deal. It may be uh, interfering time, may, may be interfering with their development, may be interfering with the achievement of objectives mainly. So that's what I wanted to bring this topic. What what do we do with time and, and how do we handle that? How do we make the decisions? And again, I'm, I'm thinking back on on another topic we discussed, making the right decisions because of the right reasons. And um, and yes, timing is one of them. Uh, I was thinking back at this to to for for this weekend uh, talk about this, and I and 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 I remember uh, something I read in, in in Jeremy Harmer's book, in in the the one about uh, English language teaching practice. Uh, I think the name is the uh, the practice of English language teaching. Yes, uh, in his book. There's a chapter in which, in which he talks about lesson planning and he discusses about this. But there's uh, something that I remember from that, uh, which is when he refers to the lesson plan as not a blueprint. The lesson plan is not the blueprint for the class. It's more than that. It's a proposal of action. And he takes a look at the lesson plan from that, that perspective. If I recall well, he kind of... Um, explains uh, or gives examples of, of different kind of lesson plans teachers may design from notes to formal, uh, very, very official, professional, uh, in-format lesson plans. Uh, but uh, bottom line, in any, any format you use, he refers to it as a proposal of action. And, uh, and I like that comment in that sense because it is, uh, at least in, from, in my mind, Looking at it from that point of view, it eases a little bit the anxiety of uh, fulfilling these steps of the lesson plan. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about achieving objectives. I'm talking about, I mean, uh, playing with the objectives like uh, uh, it doesn't matter if you don't get it. No, I'm, I'm talking about fulfilling the exact steps of the lesson plan in the time plan. And then he uh, he makes mention of three Specific, well, before going through the three specific aspects, I don't know, Ben, if you have any, any inquiry about this idea of the timing and the lesson plan. Uh, not yet. Actually, I'd like to hear a little bit more what you're about to say there, and then maybe we can, we can go into it a little bit deeper. Yeah, I, he mentions three aspects, and, and those are mainly uh, what I want to uh, uh, share a little bit with everybody. He mentions magic moments sensible diversion and unforeseen problems uh, and those exact moments as uh, critical moments in the classroom to uh, modify uh, our plan or our steps in the lesson plan and make that in progress decision and obviously for the right reason as we said last week making uh, the decisions because of the right reasons 
and and decide to change lesson plan and he even talks about totally changing the day's topic or the day's discussion or whatever was going to take place that, that day. So the first one is the magic moments. And he refers to that as unexpected conversation with the students that uh, automatically by a magic, maybe a maybe, maybe moment, as he calls it, uh, raises the interest of a student to use the language, to practice the language, to know something about the language. And, and, and yeah, I, I get the point why he mentioned that as a magic moment, because uh, it's something that mm, there may be a reason, but there may be a hundred reasons why those kind of moments rise. And then magically students are so into it that maybe is the right moment to get into that specific topic or that kind of a specific practice instead of just following your lesson plan kind of a step by step. And I, I kind of uh, look at that aspect as a kind of romantic uh, perception of it, but I like it. The second one uh, is the sensible diversion in when, in when he talks about opportunistic teaching, when the students intend somehow. Uh, this is not like kind of uh, magical or, or 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 like the first one, kind of more romantic. This is more like um, uh, a moment in the class in which students, by some reason, intend to use uh, some features of the language or some aspects of the language or some form of the language in order to convey meaning and 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 get messages through, and. Uh, and, and that becomes an important aspect that may be a good point, a good moment to talk about that, that form or, or that uh, language uh, uh, aspect and, and develop the class and lead the class towards that. And I like that idea because it's the way we, we regularly, at least here in Mexico, tend to talk when we are with friends and in confidence. You go from one topic to another and, and it works well. So this idea of the sensible diversion is uh, taking these chances of leading natural conversations and then take the advantages that in those natural conversations in which students need, uh, uh, feel, the need feel the need of using the, the language, go and talk about that aspect of language. And the last one is the unforeseen problems. Uh, and obviously this is something in which students are taking longer to... Uh, react to answer to cope with the activity to and that they obviously show a, a, a lack in the language that is interfering somehow with the natural in the classroom and that's another uh, breaking point in which you can make a decision and maybe stop the activity or stop the lesson plan in your mind and lead the classroom towards another area now those three main moments are uh, uh, the ones that Jeremy Harmon used uh, but still the point in here are uh, changing these aspects of the lesson plan and these decisions. Obviously, uh, they have to do uh, uh, with a lot with timing into, in the classroom and the achievement of objectives. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at these three. This is really interesting to me. The, the magic moment, sensible diversion, and un, uh, unforeseen problems. I really look at it two different ways, and I think they both relate to each other and very, very closely. One is how do you plan for those three? And then the other part is how do you recognize or how do we help teachers recognize those three? Because it's hard to plan for those when, right. when, when we're not really in tune and even aware when those happen. You know, so I think that students need to even have this self-awareness first of what magical moments are, but in, you know, uh, and a real example in their own case, because I think it's one thing to say, you know, explain definition wise, what it means. Right. And, I, and it's also, it's quite different maybe than really living the experience and saying, oh, okay, that was a magical moment, or yeah. that was a, a diversion. Yes. We went into a really interesting discussion that I hadn't really planned on. I mean, Maybe that's obvious. Maybe it's not for maybe uh, some pre-service English language teachers. So I think that I, the planning, and, and I'd like to hear your comments, Pity, on this, but it seems like um, as a tutor of pre-service English language teachers that we would need to kind of help 
students with the self-awareness through their own experiences about what those three are and how to plan for those kind of at the same time, it, depending on their awareness of those, but within their own context. Again, I think the definitions are, are helpful, yes. but, but yeah. really looking and drawing on specific context of teachers, teacher trainers experiences and really pulling out those magic moments, those sensible diversions, those unforeseen problems, and really having them think, okay, did you plan for those? Could you have planned for those? How might you plan for those in the future? Well, well exactly. You're making exactly my, uh, the point I thought when I was uh, reading about this. Uh, if we were in an ideal world, where we can uh, sit and lead the class as whatever happens and, and we are not tied to a program or we have the freedom to uh, just like in the ancient times, sit down and let's see what's, what we can talk about today because the bird passed by, we can talk about the birds and the trees and, and, and that would be ideal, right? That would be great. Uh, uh, but On the other hand, it's not like that. We have programs and we have objectives to achieve according to each institution. But the point in there, anyhow, and any view you have from, from one ideal aspect to, an, to, to the reality we live on, is that it requires uh, awareness, your favorite word, man. <laughs> awareness on, the, on many aspects. Uh, in order to, to work on these magical moments, sens uh, sensible diversions and unforeseen problems, you need to be aware of, first of all, the objectives and the plan you have in order to, to make these decisions, but also about the course itself, the objectives of the course, maybe the further topics or, or a broad view, not a very close-minded view of the lesson today, but a broad view of where I'm getting to with all this topic by topic into a program, into a broad objective, and also experience plays a role in here. I, I tell my, my students information, which are going to be future teachers, about improvisation, which, uh, which is never really improvisation. It has to be uh, when it's required because, and this is another topic to discuss because there are many things about to say that, but, but, but when, it's, uh, when, when you improvise, uh, uh, you don't really improvise. It's something you know from before, you plan before maybe for another occasion or something you, you know well, and somehow you are prepared with that. So, uh, so it's kind of an improvisation, but uh, indeed it's something you plan and you have maybe come to master and that's why you make the decision. And I think these three moments require that, more experience and more awareness in a broader view in order to be able to make these kind of decisions. Now, that's the first thing. And the second one going towards what you, what you mentioned, How do I really identify that this is a moment, that this is a, a moment I can take advantage of and change the plan of the day? And, and, or, or let's go to a simple class. What, how do I know this is a moment in which I can take more time in one activity and, and knowing that I'm going to cut the end of the class because I'm spending more time in this activity? So is it worth it or not? And, and I go back again to the same. It's awareness about... Um, a broader view, not just the activity itself and the moment of, oh, they're having fun, or yes, they are uh, giving me answers, or, or yeah, let's do another round in the game. Uh, it's not just the view of the moment, it's a broader view. In this case, can be a broader view of the plan itself and the objectives of the day, or maybe the week's objective, or maybe the, the, the course objective in order to start making these kind of decisions. And, and I think this is something, uh, yes, as you mentioned, The definitions may help, but it's something uh, that maybe the preparation and as a broad view, preparation as knowing you have to know more than the lesson of the day about your students and about the course itself. You have to be prepared uh, at least uh, knowing the objectives beyond the days. And, and that may lead you a little bit to identify these moments. That, that would be my opinion in that sense. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, thinking a little bit more now about some of these particular moments, a magical moment or whatever, we might be able to easily identify when maybe students are on task. You know, we can visually look at them, their behavior and see, okay, they seem to be really into the task. 
but we may not know how effective or efficient that task is if later we evaluate them and maybe they don't meet their meet the, the expectations for the class, they don't meet the objectives. So I think we also need to keep in mind that these planning these moments uh, are, are helpful, they're useful, but we also need to take into consideration uh, the evaluation of our students in conjunction with these moments together. And, and again, maybe these are separate uh, items, uh, the separate uh, phenomena. Sometimes we'll, we'll uh, assess our students at a different day or a week later, and, and then we look back and say, well, we thought they were on task, but maybe they, they didn't get what we wanted them to get out of the, the experience. So I think that it's uh, complex. It's very kind of a global holistic type of view, I think, is required for looking at uh, really trying to identify these particular moments. But I think it's very important really to try to at least plan for these as best we can. And as we get more experience, I think, uh, you know, teachers become uh, better at, at trying to create those environments where magic moments happen and, and so on. But I, I, there's one last thing I wanted to ask you about, PD, and it's kind of related to this, but, um, but maybe not directly. But what happens when students, especially teacher trainers, they realize that a, a, an activity just is not working, right? And no. You know, what do they do and how and do they even or should they even how, can they even plan for those moments? I mean, because I, I guess the assumption is first that the, the activity that they're planning on is going to work. Right. But then they get into it. Maybe it's just a complete flop. I mean, I'm speaking from experience. It happens uh, to to all of us. How do we adapt? How do we adjust on the fly? And then how do we learn from that experience? Well, what I'm doing, and I can tell you what I'm doing, uh, and this happens during the week uh, in, in the different classes I'm teaching, in, and in classes where students are helping other teachers and, and giving 15 minutes class, and teaching, uh, and teaching workshop where they teach amongst themselves in, in a 15 minutes class also. In both of them, pretty much happens uh, this, that, they, that uh, they have an activity which is not working, or they make these decisions about timing, cutting activities because of any reason. What I'm doing right now is just uh, be very, very attentive to those moments and bring them up in the in the feed, in the reflection part and feedback part of the discussion with the students and ask them why they made the decision. And they are they have different different views of it. Some of them said because they wanted to stick to the lesson plan. Some others said because they were having fun. Some others said because uh, they were giving me answers and I wanted to practice it one more time. So what I do there is that we reflect together and I try to work along with the student in order to ask and answer questions that lead us to identify how productive it was for that precise moment to cut on enlarge one activity. And, uh, and I think that that may help help them a little bit in the future to identify what's going on, because sometimes they say, I felt the students were not really participating, uh, but sometimes it's they were not participating at the, as the teacher thought in, in his or her mind, but they were actually participating and the activity was productive, but not as, as a teacher, not in the way that the teacher expected them to be shouting and screaming maybe or something or the other way around answering, but they were, uh, maybe you, when, when we have this uh, reflective moment with the whole group in, 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 in especially in teaching worship, uh, even students sometimes when the teacher himself says something, I, I thought this was happening, the students themselves come and they say, no, we were actually enjoying that moment and we were answering. The thing is that we needed a little bit more of time of thinking or, Things like those, you see. So, uh, bottom line, and 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 su uh, summing up this, the, the answer to that question is awareness. Like, reflect on that and and go to the specifics. Why do you think uh, something was effective or non-effective? Cutting or enlarging a class, did that work or not work? Why and what specific characteristics of it made it work or not? So they can start to make their own decisions in the future because. I don't think there's going to be a right formula. I just 
want to wrap up very, very quickly, Ben, because I wanted to show you a couple of a, a very a blog that I found that uh, may help a little bit on this idea of timing. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. <laughs> All right. This is uh, T is for time. This is a, a blog uh, from Scott Turnberry from a teacher from New Zealand. He's got a lot of topics uh, in it. I suppose it's from this book, which is the new A to C of ELT. And, uh, and he very quickly in here, I'm just going to scroll down so you can see, he's got a very short comment on uh, T is for time. And he's got kind of a summary and eight advices to make time efficient. And it, it, it comes to agree with what you were uh, saying in some of the aspects so you can uh, you all can go back to it later on and look at it but for example number three in 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 the recommendation number three it says evaluate an activity in terms of the likely language production it will generate against the time it will take to set up if the pay off is small ditch the activity or think of a quicker way of setting it up so pretty much uh, the eight steps, I, I, I'm, I'm sure if we go through all of them, we're going to have a lot to talk about. And some of them, some of the aspects we have already talked about. The other one that can be an example is number five. It says, set for homework. And that was interesting. Uh, and, and I'm just going to read it and leave it there. Set for homework those activities such as readings, listening, and doing grammar practice exercises that may otherwise got into classroom time that could more usefully be spent speaking, right? That's his point of view in, in that sense, but it's kind of interesting and it's very short. So uh, there's the link and, and we're going to have it, I suppose, somehow in the video on demand so you can get to it. And uh, from my end about this topic, uh, we can go on and on, but <laughs> I think for today in this topic would be enough. Yeah, I was looking over those points too, and I think your last point, number five, about setting up homework activities outside of class is really related to a lot what we might discuss if, uh, next week with the flipped learning. Uh, we'll, we'll go in a little bit more depth into uh, what that might look like. But I will say very quickly, I, I like the, uh, I found the graph in that blog post very interesting. It's a oh, list yeah. of different com countries, and I noticed um, it's, uh, it basically compares the percentage of time spent giving class versus uh, homework, administra administering homework, and uh, maintaining order. And I noticed um, Mexico, and just by visually looking at the graph, it looks like Mexico, out of all the list of countries listed here, spends more time on administrating homework than any other country on this particular list. <laughs> yes. um, and we can talk about that again. Uh, I think there's a lot of topics here we can really expand on later. Uh, but I, I really would recommend everyone take a look at that post and take a look at that chart, especially if you're in Mexico. There's some interesting, uh, I think, uh, considerations to take to take from by looking at this uh, this chart. But I think time management, really how we manage time, not just the activities itself, but just taking attendance, maintaining order, like we mentioned, and, and, and the homework aspect, I think, is big. How much time in class do we actually spend doing homework, and what what constitutes as homework? I think that's a big topic that uh, I think yep. I'm making a mental note to myself to follow right. up at a later date. Uh, that would be a good topic to look at. Yes, yeah, just for our audience, the chart is about empleo del tiempo en clase, the time uh, that it's spent into a class. And it has different features and different countries, and it's really, really interesting. So you may get back to this block, to Scott's Thornbury's block from New Zealand, and uh, and you can take a look at it. I want to remind everyone, if you want to get involved in the conversation, you can access or find us on Facebook, your learning cast. We have a public page where you can post, leave comments, give us feedback be a part of the conversation. We're always looking for teachers to actually come in and also participate with us in our live weekly Saturday morning broadcast. So we do want to thank everybody for watching as we uh, 
get into this and the building of this community. We want to make this as open and transparent as possible so that everyone has a voice, everyone has an opportunity to share their successes and challenges in the classroom. Right. Uh, send us your comments, send your just suggestions, whatever you want, please, by any means. Share our, our transmission, share uh, Facebook Live. Remember, it's a secondary transmission. The main one, it's in the link that you can see above in the Facebook Live, or uh, you can look for it in our website, Benjamin Stewart, uh, Benjamin L. Stewart, uh, WordPress.com, and homers2000.weeksite.com slash PDHA. And obviously, in the Facebook page, Teacher Learning Cast. Give a like, follow us, and share it with people. We want you to get involved. Yes, yeah, so our, our last segment, we always like to finish on uh, sharing a, an experience or, or something that we've been uh, looking at and considering uh, for the week. Pity, I don't know if you have something you'd like to share for uh, this week? Yeah, I wanted to. Uh, last week, we were discussing about um, making the right decisions because of the right reasons. And the case was a case of uh, uh, one of my students deciding on the use of a video in class because of the complexity of the language, because it was attractive, it may be very engaging, and uh, but at the end, it, it, maybe the language would be too complex, and she had an alternative video, which was the same, the same purpose, the same thing to show, but in a, a little bit more boring way, just two kids showing the performance of a game. And on the other side, we had famous people at a TV show having fun with the same game, and, and it was going to be used as instructions. The point here was that she needed to make the decision. But one extra feature was added. There was a sexual comment in the video. And, and, and that was what we discussed last week. And um, the thing was, uh, it wasn't a standby. What would she do? Which video would she pick? So I didn't have the time to talk to a student this, uh, this week about the issue. But uh, she actually... Uh, reflected on it and sent her reflection. And what she decided to do at the end, she decided to look for a third video. <laughs> she decided to look for a third, a third video, but it looks like she was uh, making a, a, a smart decision. The decision was between an attractive video with, um, uh, with famous people, which can be engaging for students, but challenge, a lot challenging in the language, and risky about the sexual topic. And on the other hand, she had the video about uh, kids playing the same game, but being very explicit about the rules of the game. So it was, it was uh, more likely that the video of the kids would be clearer, but maybe not as motivating as the other video. She was, so she looked for a third video in which she went back to, for the same game, but considering the elements she wanted to rescue from the video of the famous people. She looked for a third video with famous people, attractive and fun, but without the sexual comment and risking a little bit, taking the risk about the challenging of uh, the language. I think this is something we are going to discuss next time I see the student. But uh, her reflection to begin with about this is that she made the right decision, noticing that it was fun for students. It was challenging, but they managed to understand the instructions. So uh, at the end, this is, I, I think I need to go, and, and, and when I discuss with, her, with this student, to have um, some questions about the decision making. But I can tell because of her reflection, her written reflection, that she considered, she analyzed why she wanted the, the video with famous people and why she, she would like the video with the kids. And then at the end, she just rescued, uh, took a little bit of risk, but totally avoiding the risk on the sexual comments by looking at their video. And that's what she did at the end. And it looks like it worked. So that's the end of that story. <laughs> yeah, it would be interesting to hear uh, what her, her decision making process, you know, right. be nice to, uh, as a follow up, um, because I think that can really shed a lot of insight into you know, when she was thinking certain things, how and what point she began to really make some decisions about making those changes about the, which video and what, what types of videos to use in right. her class. 
you, you uh, I, I would like maybe maybe by reading I can uh, I, I can have this point of view uh, and 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 I'm gonna just read very quickly and and and, and the part of her reflection where she talks about this mm -hmm. says I was doubting to play the video because the language was a little bit complex and I was afraid that the students did not get what the people said. Also, there were some questions related to sex, and I don't know the students enough to guess the reactions they could have. This is something we, we actually discuss in, 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 in the pre to her class. Uh, on the other hand, I also found a video which was clearer and easy for students to understand the video, but it was boring, the video of the kids. So I could not decide what to do because of the controversial advantages and disadvantages. But this gives me the idea that she was considering the advantages and disadvantages of both, of both videos. And then it says, at the end, I found another video that was also about the same TV show, but this time I think was more accurate because it had a lighter, uh, uh, it has lighter questions on the game. So I took the risk about the language she refers to, I guess. Once I gave the class, I realized that some of the girls liked the video because One Direction, the group, appear and they are fans of them. It made me feel I made a good choice. Also, I noticed that the students had fun with the video, which means they could get almost everything that people said in it. I think, well, that's, that's, uh, that says pretty much, uh, uh, her wide perception, her broad perception about this. Maybe a couple of questions would get us into the detail of the thinking process. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. I'm just curious when she said that she didn't know the students that well. How long or how much time or contact uh, did she have with the students at that point? They've been they've been in that practice for four weeks, but she meets them once a week, I guess. Okay, so yeah. that's why, and and that's why that's one of the issues that came up when we were. Uh, looking at the lesson plan and, and making the decision of the video uh, by these questions back and forth, she brought up the the the, the 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 aspect about the sexual questions, and then I and then she she asked she actually wanted me to make the decision and asked me like uh, should I bring it or not? And I just asked her, uh, do you think your students can cope with it? And she was like, well, I'm not sure. And then the following question is, how well you know your students? So that you can uh, make that decision, just think about that, and that was the end of the the, the feedback that day. And it ha it seems that I like the idea that she even uh, took the advantages that she wanted from the videos and looked for a third one. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, insightful that she realized that she didn't. She felt she didn't know the students well enough really to do to do that. How old were the students? They are teenagers. That's why about yeah. the sexual comments. They are teenagers in in an English course, and uh, I, I don't quite not remember well the level, but uh, yeah, that, that, uh, the thing is that they go there as observers most of the time, and they just teach fifteen minutes a week. So she has taught in this group. She has taught only twice, uh, and and I think this this was the third class she was going to give. Well, the third. 15 minutes of class she was going to give. Yeah, I think it's important really to have that close relationship between the teacher and students, especially in certain hot topic uh, items that you want to bring into the class, I think. Uh, but yeah, that, that was interesting, very interesting. Right, right. So that's from my end uh, for today. I don't know, Ben, do you have any experience or anything you want to share? Sure, I'll share something here uh, very briefly. Um, this really relates a lot to your segment, uh, Pity, talking about time management and really trying to keep students on task. And one thing I wanted to share is uh, an experience I had with a writing course, and you know, trying to keep them on task. And 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 since every student is different, a lot of them will progress at different rates. I use a Canvas and a learning management system where uh, you should be able to see here, I have different modules and the modules are per week. And so each week they'll have a list of different documents to, to uh, consult and also different assignments to do. So one of the ways that I try to keep them on task as much as possible is um, I try to provide a little bit of flexibility uh, in the due dates. I have due dates specified for each assignment, but um, typically students will uh, 
you know, go at their own speed. So they will upload and complete assignments at different times. So what I'll do is, uh, I think this was earlier this week, I had students working on various different assignments at, at different times because they were all at that particular point at different uh, stages of their, of their development. So because all of the students are using Google Docs, which is a shared document that I also look at and leave comments on, I basically leave feedback through Google Docs and through Canvas, through where they actually upload their, their assignment. So students really have a lot of options. I think my point I want to make here is that students are going at different rates. At any given day, there might be two or three or maybe uh, more assignments or things that they're working on at any given time. They can choose what kind of feedback that they want to give, uh, receive, I should say, whether it's in uh, Google Docs, whether it's face-to-face. -face. Some students prefer face-to-face -face in class that, uh, where we meet uh, every day. Some students will come by my office, of course, to receive feedback, and some students will send email. They like to receive fee e uh, feedback outside of class when they're working on their work outside of class. So I think one of the things I just wanted to focus today in is looking at how technologies, in this case, Canvas, a learning management system, Google Docs, even simple email, can be used with the face-to-face -face class that I have in ways that students have really a different, uh, they can really personalize their own experience in the way that they uh, are progressing throughout the course. Of course, we have certain milestone dates that everyone needs to complete certain topic, certain assignments. But I try to leave enough flexibility in so that students can, again, work at their own space. And especially with the writing skill, which is very demanding uh, cognitively and it's, it's uh, linguistically, it's very uh, d a demanding skill. I see that, you know, that's, I think, very important to have them have that flexibility and so that they're developing at their, their own rate, right? But again, we have to try to adhere to certain uh, dates. And I think the Canvas platform especially helps in that regard because we have different modules per week with dates and then each corresponding uh, homework has, has a due date. So um, that's basically one I wanted to share, nothing too specific here, but just generally speaking from a global classroom experience, trying to find ways that students can be uh, engaged as much as possible. I try in class not to speak too much. I, I try to give them uh, class time in, uh, in each class where they're doing something, whether they're working individually or in pairs or in groups. Um, but that's been my approach and I uh, wanted to share that with you uh, today. So go ahead and stop there. So I don't know, Pity, if yeah, you're on yeah. mute. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I just had my mic mute. But um, uh, yeah, I think it's interesting because uh, it helps you, it, it twitches, it, it gives the students a different perspective of things. And uh, consciously and unconsciously, they transform certain habits. Uh, I, since I've been using platforms to, to call for papers for, for students' works and things like those, uh, and such things like you are showing us that you do, uh, students are getting used to not doing things at the end. I remember when we used to ask them in paper to deliver portfolios in paper, hard copies, uh, they would tend to leave a lot of things to the end of the semester or formats or things like they would, uh, they would take long doing in the last minute, the last day, and then the delivery day, using it for going to find a binder, put it all together and organize it. And, uh, and But you could tell that many things were done at, at the end and obviously, well, not with the same impact, especially in reflections, right, uh, which, uh, which is in my case. Uh, but having this kind of organization makes students transform and now they go week by week composing and the latest they delay in, I mean, I have maybe one or two students that may be late in the delivery of a reflection 
and and late i mean they do it before coming to the individual session but but i can tell because i receive the alerts in my mobile phone uh when they upload something i can tell that they finish the class some of them i reflect are reflecting the same at, after the class the same day same day at night so they are transforming their ways because of this useful technology management of time yeah yeah so i yeah, i think it's i think it's uh, important to really kind of look at all the different educational technologies we're using and finding what works what doesn't and really just trying to find ways to communicate in the most efficient way that helps students learn their uh, achieve their goals for a particular course right and, and so, thank you ben, for sharing with us uh, this kind of things you do in the classroom because uh, it gives always gives ideas many ideas to us well, we, this is really the intention with uh, our whole community. We really want to get more people in and sharing our ideas. I think uh, it's it to be expected that some will maybe agree or possibly disagree with us, and that's all. It's all good. Uh, we really want to have this uh, to this space to offer uh, teachers, both in service and pre-service English language teachers, to have a space to share opinions, diversify their ideas, and. Uh, really just learn from each other. So we want to thank everyone for, for listening. Remember, you can contact us through Facebook. Teacher Learning Cast is a public page. You can leave comments, give us feedback, let us know what you'd like us to talk about in the future. We can certainly revisit certain topics if you want to be part of the conversation, something that we've already talked about. We try to record all of our uh, sessions and make those available so that you can also have a uh, repository of information there as well. So uh, thank you again for uh, listening and pity. I don't know if you have any yes. closing statements. Thank you, everybody. Uh, please leave comments. And not only on this show, you can go back to look at the videos of the previous shows and uh, and you can leave comments about whatever and you can give us suggestions You if you want to come and participate with us or if you want to join the Hangout to participate uh, uh, in exploring a topic and, and having this kind of talks with us, let us know and we can arrange a date because we are, uh, we are planning to start hopefully next week with more people joining us and sharing with us. So Ben, that's it for the day, right? Yes, I think we'll go ahead and stop there. We try to keep this around an hour or so. Um, and again, we want to thank everybody for tuning in both live in the live session and also uh, the recordings. Thanks a lot, guys, and we'll see you in the next broadcast. Bye. Keep